Thank you, Acting President. Today, I will not be brief. I will oppose this extension on three grounds. One, emergency powers are hazardous to liberty and democracy. Two, liberty and democracy are good. And three, there are obvious and better way alternatives to emergency powers. I ask other members this. Do you ever reflect on how strange your job is? How incredibly weird it is to sit here and listen to others speak with these strict, these strict conventions and rules? Ever think about how bizarre it is that every four years we have an orderly transfer of administrative authority by the direction of the people? You should. Democracy is so strange as to nearly be a miracle. And this is a simple magic which makes a commonplace routine a near miracle to many of the world's inhabitants. The continuing fact that the people, by democratic process, can delegate this power, yet retain custody of it. Perhaps you and I have lived with this miracle too long to be properly appreciative. Freedom is a fragile thing and is never more than one generation away from extinction. It is not ours by inheritance. It must be fought for and defended constantly by each generation, for it comes only once to a people. Those who have known freedom and then lost it have never known it again. That was a quote from Ronald Reagan. But let's consider a saying everyone knows better. Power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. The question before us today is how quickly does it corrupt? Democracies have emergency power legislation because sometimes a, dr a drastic response to an, external, to an external threat is needed more quickly than laws can be formulated. This model is very old and copied from the Roman Republic, where the Senate could suspend their normal processes and appoint a dictator to absolute power of the state in response to a crisis. To check their power, a dictator could not hold power for longer than six months. By the year 2001 BC, Republican government capacity had developed sufficiently that it no longer needed dictators to deal with threats. Put another way, their elected representative body was good enough a government to not need to not have a government. For 120 years, they did not appoint a dictator, even once, until Sulla made himself one after marching an army against the capital. Within a generation, Julius Caesar used these powers to exceed the six-month term limit, making himself a dictator for life. And then his son became the first emperor of Rome, extinguishing 600 years of republican democracy overnight. It's easy for those who are currently exercising these emergency powers to dismiss these concerns as hyperbole, as indeed you're doing now. I'll end the history lesson there because we've basically found our answer. Power corrupts in around six months. Maybe there's a reason it's roughly that length of time, but I won't try to guess. We know that six months can be a fairly safe period of time, and that's enough to know. Now, Brett Sutton may not be Octavian, as much as he wishes he was, Dan Andrews is no Caesar. But every time we reach for emergency powers, we weaken democracy and fray the fabric of our freedoms. But I have a message for my crossbench colleagues who are considering voting for this today. To be clear, I don't believe it's a conspiracy to overthrow our democracy. And this is not 1933 Germany. But we should learn that enabling dictatorships in any way can have far-reaching consequences. Who now remembers the names of the members of the Reichstag who voted for the Enabling Act in 1933? Yet the effects of that vote echo through history. The damage of this extension of unchecked government power will ripple through the social fabric of society, long after the names of the crossbenchers who support it are forgotten. In March, when the state of emergency was enacted, I stood here and said I wouldn't stand in the government's way, but I would watch carefully how the powers were used. Well, now I've watched how you've used them. On the basis of your misuse of these powers, I don't want to just block this extension. I want to repeal the emergency legislation altogether. The risk of the misuse of these powers, the cost of abuse of these powers is just too high. This is not a tool that Liberal Democratic governments should have. You have demonstrated that this risk is just too great. Normally when I stand in this place and talk about freedom, we are dealing with the usual encroachment of government into our lives, the gradual erosion of liberty. Well, this is the same, but the virus emergency has put the erosion of freedom on fast forward. Suddenly it's clear to many people who otherwise would not have paid attention. Instead of the slow boil, the heat has been turned up 
suddenly, and some of the frogs have noticed. If we don't make a stand now, not only will we be trapped in this ongoing nightmare indefinitely, but in future the government will be happily reaching for emergency powers again and again, more and more often for smaller and smaller issues. There's always life to save if only you have the power. The damage that this is doing, not just to our democracy but to civil society, is immense and it will reverberate for decades. Nothing that comes from this will be good. The institutions of our liberal democracy will survive this state of emergency, but they will not survive unscathed. And that's what this boils down to. It's not a deliberate conspiracy to extinguish liberty and democracy in Victoria. It's just a symptom of rule by a type of politician who doesn't see the value of either. For Premier Andrews and people like him, democracy and liberty are inconveniences, not an important and treasured part of who we are. Liberty is what makes life worth living. The disdain which some people in this place hold liberty in is a travesty. The lack of respect for democracy and the freedoms and dignities of all Victorians is disgusting. When Patrick Henry said, give me liberty or give me death, he didn't mean that he didn't like life very much. He meant that a life without, living, a life, a life without liberty was not a life worth living. I happen to agree with him. A great many people do. Probably most of those who do not do, not do so, only do, do, only do not do so because they were born into the miracle of freedom and have only recently been exposed to life without it. Australian prisoners are clothed, clothed, fed and sheltered by the state, but they have a suicide rate of between 300 and 1,000 times higher than the general population. Gone are the days of du dungeons and rats and state torturers, but even with a relatively comfortable prison, it's still a prison and life without freedom is not worth living for many. This belief is the core belief of classical liberalism. Some believe in liberty because they believe it works better than other systems. Classical liberals believe in liberalism because they believe that liberty is its own highest good. That even when better outcomes might be obtained by removing freedom, it should not be done. Prior to and early in the Cold War, we didn't know that communism would wreck economies. Many people thought that a centrally controlled command economy would be more efficient and grow faster than a free economy. They didn't know how bad the corruption or abuse of power would be. But classical liberals opposed it. Anyway, we believe that a country without liberty could be as wealthy as you care to imagine and it still would not be worth living in. In short, we believed it would, it would just be a more comfortable prison. A gilded cage is still just a cage and we are right to oppose it. So too now. Making every Victorian a prisoner, literally and metaphorically, is wrong. It's wrong whether it's better for public health or not. I don't think it's clear at all that these public health interventions have been effective. In fact, the emerging evidence is overwhelmingly clear that they cause more harm and will cause more harm than they prevent. But even if they didn't, they would still be wrong. But I don't just represent classical liberals. I also represent all the differing strands of the philosophies of freedom. So let me address why opposing emergency power extension represents them as well. Liberty is not a crippling liability, it's our greatest strength. Because free economies do outperform controlled ones. Because liberal democracies do outperform autocracies. Because civil society does shape behaviour where police fail. The uncountable use of emergency power is causing more harm than it's preventing. Liberty is a heuristic for success in almost every field of public policy. Enforced control doesn't work and freedom to cho choose always wins. Unaccountable emergency powers disallow voluntary cooperation and the search for innovative solutions. If the government didn't mandate face masks and simply advise their use, as occurred in Queensland, it would be just as effective and perhaps more so. Similarly, we know from Google's location tracking data that the difference in foot traffic is not very dissimilar between lockdown and not lockdown places. People are perfectly capable of assessing risk themselves and acting rationally to protect themselves. We know from the experience in Japan, where laws prevented them from following coercive strategies, that non-coercive strategies can work very well. There is little evidence that government intervention have been effective at all. Every time this government's emergency lockdowns have come into effect, it has been when the case numbers are already declining due to voluntary community action. Voluntary compliance and incentives would have worked much better than beating us with a stick. 
but the government has never tried voluntary compliance. You cannot be trusted with an extension of these powers because you will abuse them. And let's be clear here. We're not having a second wave because the government did too little. We're having a second wave because the government is incompetent and unaccountable. The government used emergency powers to set up a hotel quarantine system that did not simply fail, it acted as an incubator and an infection vector for the rest of the state and the rest of the country. Colonel Klink and Sergeant Schultz could have run a better quarantine facility than this government. The investigation of what incurred is also being stage managed by the government. The government used its influence with the crossbench to ensure that an independent committee could not be raised to scrutinise the government's quarantine powers. Instead, we got PAYAC, a government controlled committee investigating. And the hotel quarantine investigation? Terms of reference approved by the government and operated by those picked by the government. Both will do their best to ensure transparency and accountability, I'm sure, but they've been intentionally hamstrung from the start. Many people in the regions are wise to this. They are angry that the city-centric policies of this government have left the, locked them in a stage three lockdown despite the absence of infection. They're observant enough to see that this government only governs for the cities. They are smart enough to know that alternatives exist to indefinite emergency powers. They know that six months is long enough to consider and draft legislation. And they're right. The emergency extension is a sad crutch for an incompetent government that doesn't respect liberty or democracy. The government has had six months to develop and pass temporary legislation to deal with coronavirus. Legislation is by far a better tool for responsible government than emergency powers, <laughs> because it is accountable. You can't just make it up as you go along. Everyone knows where they stand and it doesn't change on a whim. It's also subject to parliamentary scrutiny and is easier to enforce and protect in court. And while we're talking about courts, the press has not been talking about clause six of the draft law because the focus has been on the potential for a 12 month extension, so it may have escaped attention. But let me, let me bring that front and centre for just a moment. Clause six of this bill actually changes how the emergency powers operate and lowers the already low bar for the government in employing coercion with the emergency powers. Previously, the use of the emergency powers had to be necessary, but given that many of the actions taken under these powers by this government are unlikely to meet that legal definition of necessary, if it's challenged in court, the government is watering it down to reasonably necessary. This sounds like a small change, but it's an enormous one. The government isn't satisfied to continue to rule by decree. It wants to make it harder for anyone to hold it accountable when it destroys lives. You've had six months to come up with a reasonable solution, but the thrill of rule by decree has turned your head. You've been living in a bubble of advisors and bureaucrats, bureaucrats with public sector jobs, telling you what a good and necessary job you're doing. You haven't been listening to the people, the people who are breaking under the weight of lockdown. After six months, the people don't need this extension. The people of Victoria need hope. And today, you are snatching that hope from their hands and dashing it on the ground. You have opened Pandora's box, but you've thrown away the hope. If you pass this today, despair in the community is going to spike. But you hold those who disagree with you in contempt. You hold the parliament in contempt because the emergency powers allow you to. You hold the people in Victor of Victoria in contempt because the emergency powers allow you to. I have no intention of giving the government another six months to extend, of extended and less accountable emergency powers as a reward for failing to do the job of legislating for the last six months. Maybe if the government was less focused on a daily press conference and trying to control the news cycle, they'd be here pre presenting a workable legislative solution to us today, but they're not. They're not because they have a disdain and disinterest in liberty and democracy. The Liberal Democrats stand for liberty and democracy, so we will not support this authoritarian power fantasy today, and I condemn any member of this place who does. <laughs>